Hi, today I'm going to be talking about books that I recommend if you are interested in Germanic Paganism. Usually I start these recommended book videos by talking about the primary sources. I'm going to do something a little different today though because there are plenty of people out there who are interested in Germanic Paganism who are very familiar with this information and if they start watching this video and see me do that they'll just figure I'm talking about the same old, same old and there are two very important books that I want to make sure that people know about. So I'll start with those two. First one is called More Than Mythology. It's a collection of 10 papers presented at a conference in Copenhagen in 2008. As the title implies, it covers fields other than the mythology, which is what you usually find in books on Germanic paganism. There's a fair amount of information in here on, on uh, archaeology. There's one very interesting one called Fictive Rituals in Volispa. So it's not dealing with just the text, but what can be teased out of the text. So it's not so much interested in just the stories in the text, but other little tidbits you can get from the text. Because it's from 2008, it's, it's pretty much cutting edge. I like this one even more. It's called Old Norse Religion in Long-Term Perspectives. This is a collection of papers from a 2004 conference. There are 80 papers in here, so based on the thickness of the book, you can see that papers are only three or four pages long. A lot of them are essentially notes on work in progress, but even if that is a little frustrating, it gives you an idea of the most up-to-date information. It covers a very large variety of topics. There's a fair amount in here on burial rituals. There's an article on, on Odin. There's one on Loki that interprets him as a god of change. There's some on um, cosmology, on female roles, wide variety. A couple of things about the book. Um, it's up to date. It's written for a conference held in Scandinavia, and that means that I'd say about 80 to 90 percent of the references are in either Scandinavian languages or German. That's a little frustrating because it means they're difficult to get hold of, and even if they were able to be hold of, I certainly don't read any Scandinavian languages. Most of us probably don't. But it does mean that we're getting a glimpse into the scholarship in other countries that we wouldn't otherwise. It gives us a little flavor for what these sources are that we have, would have troubles getting access to. The most important thing you get from this book and from the more than mythology book is a feel for just how much variation there was from place to place and time to time in the Germanic regions which is a little frustrating and disappointing for those of us who are trying to reconstruct some sort of workable Germanic paganism because it means that anything we'll come up with has to be taken a little bit from here, a little bit from there, a little bit from then, a little bit from then, and we end up with a synthetic religion that wasn't practiced anywhere in ancient times. But it's the truth, so we have to deal with it. And this does a really good job of showing you how it should be dealt with. Okay, now to go back to the more traditional approach. To start with the continental Germans, our main primary source for them, of course, is Tacitus' book Germania. It was written around the first century, and it was written by a Roman. So there's always a question of what his motives were and who his sources were. There's not that much in it about the religion. But there is some, and it's our major source, so you have to be familiar with it. To turn to secondary sources, this is Myths and Symbols in Pagan Europe. It's by H.R. Ellis Davidson, a very highly respected scholar. She did a lot of work in Germanic paganism. This is interesting because it does compare the Celts and the Germans, and it's always good to, to compare peoples that live together, live near each other, or have similar cultures. It's also important because we usually think of the border between the uh, Celts and the Germans as being the Rhine with the Celts on the west and the Germans on the east, but it's a very permeable border and there were Celts on the east and Germans on the west as well. And they created a, a kind of a mixed culture, uh, which is, I think is a very interesting culture. There are cases of deities where we're not really sure whether they were a Germanic deity or a Celtic deity, uh, or they could have been both. So. Her book covers that sort of topic. Lady with a Mead Cup by Michael J. N. Wright. Subtitled Ritual, Prophecy, and Lordship in the European War Band from La Ten to the Viking Age. 
So yeah, it's a little bit scary. It's, it's uh, fairly complex. It starts out with the scene in Beowulf of the Queen Wesleyal uh, coming out with, with a cup to give to the chieftain and then pass it around to the, to the warriors. And it asks the question of what's going on with that. It then proceeds to take a tour of the Germanic and Celtic worlds to try to tease out the meaning of, the, of that incident. It can, therefore contains a fair amount of information on the sacred cup, uh, the sacred drink rather, on eating rituals, dining rituals, and prophecy as well, and there's the role of women in all these areas. It might be a little hard to get hold of, but, uh, but I found it very useful for my purposes. All right, now let's turn to the Anglo-Saxons. The major problem with the Anglo-Saxons was that they converted to Christianity very shortly after they invaded England. So there's only a small window from which we could get information on their, their paganism. The major primary source is Beowulf. It's written by a Christian. So there, there's that. Uh, but there's a large sense of the feel of what it was like to be a pagan in, in the Germanic cultures there, what, was, what their worldview was, for instance. It's also a Rip Roaring story. And, uh, gives us information on the battle between hero and giant, which is a very important part of Germanic mythology. This particular translation is a fairly new one by uh, Seamus Haney. Interesting because it's, uh, it's got the, the old English on one side and the modern English on the other, and that's always fun. And it was also translated by someone who was a poet in his own right, so he has a good feel for what it should sound like from a poetic point of view. Remember, this would have been one of the things recited in the hall, so it should have a feel for it. Rites and Religions of the Anglo-Saxons by Gail Owen. Uh, it says religions because it includes a section on Christianity, which makes sense because the Anglo-Saxons were Christian for a large time of when they existed. But there are a number of chapters in here on paganism. There's one on everyday life in pagan times. There's uh, one section on gods and legends, and so on. It's one of the few books available that does a summary of Anglo-Saxon paganism. A more specialized book uh, interested me because of one of the goddesses involved in it. It's called Pagan Goddesses in the Early Germanic World, Elstra, and the Cult of Matrons by Philip Shaw. It's not very thick, but it's pretty academic. It's interesting to watch Shaw tease information out of what we have, the limited data that we have, especially uh, linguistic data, which is always fun for me. He comes to the conclusion that Estra was actually a local goddess and that identifying her with the dawn and the spring is, is inaccurate. I don't agree with him, but it's nice to watch him come to his conclusions and there's a fair amount of primary source data in here that you're not going to get anywhere else. It's nice also that he deals with the goddess Hreda. I've never even heard of her before. She's not a very well-known goddess, so it's nice to see that being dealt with. Okay, now to turn to the ones that sort of overlap. This is a Germanic Sacrifice by Mary Susan Neff. As you can tell, it's, it's a photocopy. Uh, it's her dissertation. It was written in 1980. It, covers all the information known at that time from uh, the texts and from archaeology about, uh, about sacrifice, about the rituals, about um, what animals were sacrificed to which deities, where they were sacrificed, and so on. The archaeology is out of date, of course, being from 1980, but her treatment of the uh, text is very interesting, and some of the archaeology information is useful. Uh, she also goes into linguistic information, which I always find useful. Like I said, this is a dissertation. You can probably get it from Dissertation Express. If so, I'll include a link to it in the description. Just as a fun aside, uh, to show you how little work there is in the academic field, she, entered, she got involved in computers and became a fairly well-known uh, computer expert. The Well in the Tree by Paul Bauschatz. Uh, this is a photocopy as well, although I got it on eBay. The Well in the Tree, as you can figure out from the title, talks a lot about the Germanic cosmology. It talks about, it, about both the spatial aspects 
and the temporal aspects. Oh, there's a large section here that deals with things connected with uh, weird, including uh, one, it's actually a number of, the chapters are almost separate articles. Uh, there's one on, on Beowulf and the concept of fate in Beowulf. This is something that you pretty much need to have if you are interested in Germanic paganism because he does just such an excellent job of discussing the cosmology, which is, of course, so important to any religion, and particularly to Norse religion. So turning to the Norse side, and I, their uh, primary sources are very interesting. They're the Eddas. This is the, the prose Edda by uh, Snorri Sturluson, written in the 13th century. Um, by a Christian, but he seems to have been trying to preserve as much as possible of the uh, earlier material, trying to save something from the wreck of paganism, um, particularly the poetry. So the Christian influence is not as great as one might expect. There are an awful lot of quotations in here from uh, various poems that have disappeared otherwise. There's a large section on the Kennings. There was a tendency among the, the uh, Norse poets to use terms other than to actually name something. Um, it was kind of elegant to refer to an axe as the strong ice, or uh, let's see, I'll look in here, a sword is death flame. And those are always fun, they can be used in writing poetry and rituals. There's also a large section on the mythology. Uh, a lot of what we know about Norse cosmology comes from uh, Snorri. The Poetic Edda, on the other hand, is a little earlier, still Christian era, and anonymous. It's a collection of poems on various mythological sources. The most famous one is Voluspa, which has a lot of information in there about the, the cosmology and also about the end of the world and the beginnings of the world, for that matter. This particular translation is by Lee Hollander. A little frustrating because he decided to use as much as possible Germanic words. So it, sometimes it's a little bit forced or, or awkward, but it's considered a very accurate translation and it's easily available. The sagas include tidbits here and there of Germanic paganism. Most importantly, it gives you an idea of the world they lived in and uh, their legal systems, which form a very important part of their worldview. There are parts there that specifically refer to the religion. Some are frustrated and I'll say things like, and he was baptized by the customs of that time. Like, I'd really like to know what those customs were. I'm not sure the writer of the saga knew them. He might have just thrown them in himself. This particular edition is the sagas of, Isl of Icelanders. There are sagas that aren't in here, but this is a collection of most of them. Sometimes the sagas can be a little bit boring, but sometimes they're rip-roaring stories that would actually make pretty good movies. You know, all in all, though, they, they need to be read so you can get a feel for the worldview of at least the Icelandic pagans. Turning to secondary sources, another book by H. R. Ellis Davidson, Gods and Myths of Northern Europe. It's sort of old. She concentrates, uh, as, as the title implies, on the myths. Their sections divided up in large section by deities. And again, she relies most heavily on the written sources, particularly the Eddas. It's a classic. It's a really good introduction to uh, the overall paganism. As we would have learned from the first books here, this sort of paganism varied from place to place. And what's in here is essentially a synthesized version, but it's what we got. Myth and Religion of the North by uh, Dervil Petra. Uh, it's from 64, I believe, so it's pretty old, but uh, it's still highly respected. It covers things in great depth, a lot of information on, um, a lot of quotations from poems that you wouldn't otherwise know, or wouldn't otherwise have access to, probably haven't even been translated. So it gives you more, more so primary sources than you would ordinarily. It's arranged primarily by deity, but under each deity it's pretty darn exhaustive. I found it, I was kind of surprised at how 
useful. I found this book since it's kind of old. This one's a little bit controversial. Gods of the Ancient Norsemen. I'm sorry, Gods of the Ancient Northmen by uh, Georges Dumézil. Uh, he was an Indo-Europeanist, and he had his own theories about how Indo-European culture was organized. And some have uh, criticized him for cramming Norse uh, culture into his previously existing framework. I think his framework does give some insight, although you should never take it as the be-all and end-all. And he actually himself didn't. But it's interesting to see it treated, to see the subject treated in um, a comparative approach. This is a very recent book, Nordic Religions in the Viking Age by uh, Thomas Dubois. Again, it says religions. In this case, it's because he also talks a lot about the Sami and the Finns, uh, who did have some influence on the Norse religion. One of the things you pick up from reading books like this one and like the, the, the conference papers is that uh, the people that think of Norse paganism as somehow purely Germanic uh, just really haven't done the research. So he did, does talk a lot about um, those sorts of influences. The fact that it's very recent is really nice. Again, a lot of good primary sources mixed in here. So to me, it should be on every Germanic pagan's bookshelf. This one here is a very specific book. It's called Thor the Wind Razor and the Ireland Image. Uh, there's a link to a copy of it in the discussion. It discussing a particular image that may or may not be of Thor, and the author is arguing that it is an image of Thor and why. So it tells you a lot about Thor in general. And it's just fun to watch him watch him go through the process. Uh, he, he talks about an aspect of Thor that generally isn't considered, which is uh, the god of storms, and therefore he would be the god of the wind, and therefore a god to pray to if you're a sailor. So it's nice to see that particular aspect of Thor dealt with. Okay, those are uh, the books that I'm I want to recommend. Uh, there are lots of articles out there online put there by academics. Easiest way to search for them is to go to Google, go to the advanced search and search for books. I'm sorry, search for sites that are PDFs because most academics put their material online as PDFs and most people who aren't academics don't put articles, they put anything online in PDF form. So you're filtering out a lot of the, the less useful information. I've included a link to a number of articles that I found online in the uh, discussion. So that's a good place to start and then you can look at the reference section of those articles. It's always good to look at reference sections to give you an idea of where to go next and the more recent the book the, the better for uh, the reference section. I hope this has been of use to you. If you're interested in what I do please subscribe. I, will, I probably won't be doing any more recommended uh, reading lists as far as uh, the Indo-Europeans are concerned because I've tackled pretty much all the ones that I have enough information on. But if you uh, look at my channel, you'll see that I've, I have done recommended reading lists on a number of the other Indo-European cultures. So thank you for watching and goodbye.